another episode of Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. I'm your host, Patrick McCormick, and I have a special guest with us today. This is Christine Gear, and Christine is a certified educator in the state of Connecticut, and she is also a research assistant and an MPH candidate at the BU School of Public Health in Boston, um, which is near and dear to my heart because I'm also a graduate of the BU School of Public Health, um, so she picked the right school. So great choice, Christine. Thank you. And Christine has been doing a job shadow with our office at the Uncas Health District, which uh, we certainly are, are always willing to have uh, students come and visit with us, whether they be grad students or undergraduates, to learn a little bit about what we do in public health. Uh, so welcome and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what brings you to Eastern Connecticut. I think you have a little history here. I do. So I was born and raised in Griswold. I went to Griswold High School and then I went to undergrad at Eastern Connecticut State University. Uh, I was able to work with Grow Wyndham, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization working on health issues, particularly nutrition issues in the area. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to work with NFA to do my student teaching. Uh, and then I also worked there as a long-term substitute and I also worked with the Diversity Center to help work with their summer program. So what made you first choose to become an educator? Let's start there. So many reasons. Education is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I love working with particularly middle schoolers and high schoolers. That age group is, is very interesting. A lot of attention often goes to very small children or uh, older adults and sometimes that age group gets overlooked yeah. and they have very particular needs and so it was very important to me to work with those students and, and help them in that very crucial time period in their life. So it sounds like you then had a difficult choice to make. Do you stay in education? Uh, but it sounds like you had some sort of an interest in public health. So why did you make that transition then from education into public health? This is actually a question I get asked a lot, and it's not a simple answer. Uh, I was very, very dedicated to education. And one thing that I noticed in the classroom, though, was that a lot of issues that are often identified as education issues, such as low test scores or dropout rates, I started thinking that those issues may be more public health issues. Mm -hmm. So I was really concerned about violence, the impact of violence on school success rates or performance rates, things of that nature, and also performance in the classroom, um, different stressors that are happening in the environment, uh, things like possibly lead poisoning, substandard housing, um, drug addictions that children may witness or domestic violence, interpersonal violence, things that are happening in their surroundings that then are brought with them into the classroom uh, and many people may not identify those issues as being correlated to that student's performance mm. and I think that schools are very savvy and aware that that those issues are going on but it's difficult to identify them sometimes so, so is it that the health district wasn't doing its job well enough and now all these children were presenting in such a way that you had to get into public health? I, I think that health districts do an amazing job and schools oh, do an amazing you. job also. Yep. And I, I think what compelled me to, to transition into the public health field was that I wanted to sort of bridge this gap and connect the two fields because I think that they're happening simultaneously, but the interaction between the two um, there's such an opportunity f for change and uh, to address issues with a, a combination of approaches. So hopefully uh, once I gain the skills and the certification mm -hmm. with BU, I'll be able to do more with that. So now obviously with uh, public health, we always say prevention is the key to what we do. That if we can prevent somebody from getting sick, that that's really our goal. Um, so as a health educator, and as in, you know, you're kind of that combination of public health educator, education background, local public health now experience. Um, how do you think you need to get a message across to especially a young person um, about those public health issues in a way where they're going to be able to um, make those changes in their lives that are, are going to be necessary? So, well, first, 
My education certification is actually in history and social sciences, so okay. I'm not certified as a health educator yeah. at this time, um, but I but have the background. Sort of bringing those two things together. Right. Um, so I'm hoping that, especially with my concentration in social behavioral sciences, I can identify how behaviors are made mm -hmm. and then with that build upon that and and really ask myself and ask the people that I'm working with why are these behaviors happening and how can we change that behavior from sort of the ground up. So expand on that a little bit the social and behavioral sciences piece. Um, I think people hear that you go for a master's in public health well what's your field of study? Well it's public health um, but what exactly is social behavioral sciences? Is that the concentration that you have within the School of Public Health or and then what does that encompass? So public health is divided into multiple concentrations. Um, there's epidemiology, there's biostatistics, there's health law, um, maternal child health, and environmental health, and I went with social behavioral sciences because, and I think that this comes from my background in history and social sciences as well as education, there's such a social component and a behavioral component to health issues. They don't occur in a vacuum. And so we need to be able to identify why these health issues are occurring and what are s sort of the social constructs in which they're occurring. Um, and so that's... So, so have you been able to narrow where it is you'd like to go with the experience you're getting from the School of Public Health in terms of the workforce? And I think that that's something that's a little tricky because there are so many opportunities in public health. It's almost like there are too many choices. You can go in so many different directions, which is absolutely fantastic. It, it allows you to be much more flexible and really shape your own career. Um, right now I'm researching, I'm working as a research assistant and we have a publication in the works. Uh, it's, it's in review with psychosomatic medicine right now. So that's been, a fantastic opportunity and I, I love researching and I, I like that the findings are able to create action later on. Um, what I do miss is being able to work hands-on with individuals, which I was able to do at both Grow Wyndham and in the education field. Mm -hmm. So I would like my future career to reflect both sort of the behind the scenes research and information portion as well as being able to work and see the changes with the people and get feedback directly from them. Great. So now, what was it that caused you to call us at a local health district in Connecticut and say, I'm interested in an internship or a job shadow or learning more about what you do? Um, you know, how'd you hear about us and what was it that, that prompted you to, to call us? So, sort of a few different answers to that. Uh -huh. um, working in Boston has been absolutely fantastic. It's a large city, there are very many opportunities. From the public health standpoint, I think that a lot of funding is often given to larger cities where um, so it's a little bit more progressive, a little bit more advanced, and some smaller communities that have very similar health issues but maybe on a smaller scale are overlooked. And coming from this area, I've still been very passionate about bringing what I learn in other places back and, and to expand upon that and bring those services to people who may be underserved or overlooked. So, so my hope is that you'll obviously get a job in a foundation because you understand that we need that money. And then we're going to send all of our applications to you <laughs> and you're going to give us a blank check and say, absolutely, local public health in Connecticut deserves all the funding that we have. Right? That's, that's the plan, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we've been talking about that for two days. Perfect. So do you think that BU has adequately prepared you for, for the work that you're seeing you know, in the community, that, that the need arises? You go back to BU and you're going to say, boy, you gave me everything I needed to be able to, to hit the ground running when I get into the workforce? I speak very highly of BU and their approach to preparing their students to be ready for the workforce. I do think that each program is tailored and it is what students make of it. Yeah. So even within my program specifically, depending on which concentration you're going into, different courses are required of you. And then you're able to pick other courses that you want to add in addition as electives. So I think 
anybody who may be going into that field, it's very wise to look at the courses that you're able to choose from and look at more skills-based courses. Mm. Um, so that way you're building your skill set. So for example, uh, somebody who is getting a degree in uh, public health with a concentration in epidemiology, it would be, or biostatistics, to take a SAS course or something so that they come out with that skill set to analyze data. Or for my concentration, social and behavioral sciences, to take a program management course, which I'm actually doing next semester, so that I know how to design a program sort of from the ground up and be able to go out into the workforce eventually and apply that. So we um, obviously have people in the audience that um, aren't necessarily going to go into a school of public health um, or don't necessarily know if they even want to go into something like public health. Um, what would you recommend in terms of that making that type of decision? Um, you know, what did you do in terms of uh, you know, looking into schools that were available to you? Um, how did you come up with that decision that I'm definitely going to go to this particular school? Because um, there may be young people who are watching who are saying, you know, I'm really not sure what I want to do with myself, and she made that decision, and she came up with a place that worked for her. How do I do the same thing for myself? Well, anyone who knows me knows I was completely crazy while I was trying to figure out which school I was going to go to because it was a really difficult decision. Yeah. And um, I, I don't envy anyone who's trying to make that decision because it is really difficult. Um, and, you know, you really have to keep in mind what you hope to do in the future and not necessarily look at it is important to look at the reputation of the school but really look at what that particular program offers especially once you're in the graduate level yeah. um, because each school is going to offer different resources different details to their program so one school may specialize in one area but then their school in another area just isn't quite as good so you so it's really detail oriented once you get to the graduate level. Um, I did have a very difficult decision. I applied and was accepted to UConn, UMass Amherst, Brown University, and BU. Um, and I was very, very close to picking Brown University. Um, and I, I changed my mind for multiple reasons. Um, BU seemed extremely supportive of the particular area that I wanted to go into with yeah. public health, which was a, a little unconventional and, you know, bridging the gap between public health and education isn't something that's done every day. Right. And I think that their program was a little more conducive to achieving that goal. Yeah. Um, and I speak very highly of all of the other programs. I mean, that's why I applied to those other programs. Mm -hmm. I, I value them very much and I think that they're great. But for me personally, I just felt a better fit and a better energy with BU. So what do you think if a, um, a student were looking at a way to set themselves apart, uh, what types of things do you think would be helpful to them as they're trying to make themselves a little different than every other student who's out there? Um, do you look at internships? Um, did you do any specific training? Uh, what makes you unique that you could sell yourself to a, to a job in public health down the road? I would say passion and effort. People want to see that you're really committed to what you're doing and that you have the experience and that you sort of went above and beyond in pursuing that. Uh, a lot of the positions I was able to acquire in undergrad came from just looking up online different places that that were doing different programs and contacting them, just sort of cold calling them, mm -hmm. um, asking if, if they had different opportunities. Or in the classroom, for example, I was, I was hired by one of my professors to become a research as assistant with yeah. her. Um, and the opportunity just presented itself because she saw that I was really engaged in the classroom and really passionate about what I was doing. Uh, and I was able to work with her on research for jail diversionary programs. Um, and she actually also recommended I eventually get into the field of public health, so, so I have her to thank for that also. Mm -hmm. um, and so any student who really feels passionate about what they do, just keep going after that and be as creative as you possibly can because 
there isn't always a clear cut path to get there right. and don't don't let that slow you down. So you and I have had an interesting couple of days in terms of discussion about what it's like to be a school public health student today versus when I was there. Um, now I don't think I was there that long ago, but the more I hear about your experience, the more I realize it was quite a long time ago. Um, it was pre-Facebook, it was pre-Twitter, it was pre, uh, it was almost pre-laptop. Um, I think I got my first laptop when I went to the School of Public Health. Um, so we had talked about you know, sitting in line to be able to look up data um, where now you can Google everything. Um, we had talked about uh, you know, the way you can surf the internet to find things, especially around things like jobs, um, where I remember going to career services and you know, getting a printout of what was available. Um, trying to network with people was very difficult. It was always a person to person where um, now obviously you can go in and search jobs all day long. Um, but you know, maybe you could speak a little bit to how you use technology to support the work you do where you know, back when I was, uh, you know, using, uh, uh, you know, chipping into a, a cement wall or something <laughs> to be able to write. Um, you know, how are you using technology today or where do you see technology taking you in terms of looking into public health issues? So technology is really great and fantastic and helpful. Uh, the one criticism I would have is that we're very dependent on it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I use technology every single day exhaustively. Yeah. I, I use it so much. But if that system were to be interrupted, I think that, especially from a research standpoint, it would be, it would be really difficult because, um, for example, conducting literature uh, reviews and searches, things of that nature, I wouldn't be able to do that without accessing the database. So, so having those skills and being able to really search through file after file and document after document and being able to log the data and analyze the data, mm -hmm. um, it would be extremely difficult and we wouldn't be able to do it at the rate that we're doing it and also to the detail that we're doing it without the use of technology. So obviously you seem like uh, somebody who's interested in that person-to-person -person contact um, and being in Boston, you obviously have a big city, um, a diverse population. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to meet people that are different than you. Um, how have you been able to um, take advantage of the fact that you're in Boston and you have that opportunity to, to meet people of different cultures, people who speak different languages? Um, you know, is it, is it create an a, a obstacle for you or do you see that as an opportunity? It's an immense opportunity and I actually think that that opportunity really started here in Connecticut especially working with Willimantic in Norwich mm -hmm. the population is very very diverse and that was part of what compelled me to work with those areas mm -hmm. because the health needs are very complex and intertwined with different social structures political structures um, community needs and that was what was very interesting to me and what motivated me to sort of, I guess, seek out an environment that would, um, that may need uh, help in that respect. Yeah. So Boston has a very diverse culture um, and we were able to do a community needs assessment for a um, public housing, location and that it, it's always rewarding to be able to personally go to a location, speak with the community and be able to identify what they need by speaking with them and by doing the, da the data collection and the research rather than from afar trying to tell them what they need. There, there's no way that we can tell somebody else what they need. Right. It, it's completely counterintuitive to actually helping someone. Right. So to be able to go to communities and work with them hands-on and reach out um, and hear from them what they identify as their health issues mm -hmm. and how they see public health professionals, how, how they can help them. Um, I think that that community partnership is so valuable and it can't be discounted. So have you, since you've left Griswold and uh, gone up to Boston and now you're in the School of Public Health, when you come back home, are there issues or things that you see on a 
daily basis that maybe you hadn't seen before, identified in um, areas where you'd like to see either local health or other folks like us to be able to help the community or do more for the community? I think that there are a lot of similar issues that may be overlooked in southeastern Connecticut, or not necessarily that they're overlooked, but that the structures and funding isn't necessarily in place to, to do something about them. I think that people are aware that those issues are there, mm -hmm. but people sort of have their hands tied with doing something about it if, if they don't have the funding or the means to do something about it. Right. Um, and in Boston, I've, I've noticed similar issues to a larger extent, mm -hmm. and I think that they have the capability, just because of the nature of Boston and the resources that are there, mm -hmm. they're able to do so much and to be extremely progressive. Uh, for example, in terms of the opioid crisis that's going on, they're very proactive about that and they're trying many different creative approaches um, to addressing that. And also violence, looking at violence as a public health issue, the cost of violence and the social implications, uh, the, the stress-related illness that can come from it, things like that I don't think are typically viewed as a, an issue that should be addressed by a local public health department. Right. I think that water supply, um, we've been talking about Typical Zika and, yeah. and E. coli, things of that nature, are, are typically what people think of when they think of a local health department. Mm. But I think that there's opportunity to become a leader and, and to really um, show innovation and initiative in approaching these other issues too that have such long-term effects, um, such as violence, addiction, and not just the opioid addiction, but mm. other forms of addiction also. So we became the health district for town of Griswold in 2010. Tell me what it is that you love about the town of Griswold that I, as the outsider who came in in 2010, maybe don't know about. Um, what, what do you enjoy when you come home, those types of things? There's a certain sense of strength and community in Griswold that I just haven't felt in other places. and and. You know, I've traveled around a bit and I've been other places. And when I come to Griswold, it, I mean, f not to sound cliche, but it feels mm. like coming home, oh. literally. Uh, it, you know, so it has this very small town nature that, that places where people are constantly coming and going sort of lose. And there are so many families in Griswold that are generational. So people who have been there for years and years, their um, grandparents grew up there, etc. Yeah. And so I think that that really sets Griswold apart from other places. But just because Griswold has this amazing sense of community doesn't mean that it, it doesn't also have its own health issues. Um, mm -hmm. As we're aware, there's an opioid crisis going on. Uh, and, and so I think that if we can harness the sense of community and really work with that to, mm -hmm. to propel the town sort of through, through this issue um, and work with its resources and not against it. So I think I told you that, you know, this Eastern Connecticut is one of the few places I've been where you can find a street name and then you can find the person with that same name yes. that lives on the street. <laughs> so when you go to Gear Avenue, you can find Gear somewhere on that road. Yeah. And if you find Lathrop, you know, you're likely to find Lathrop on the street. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot to be said for that because not only do you have the history of the place, but the people can describe the history of the place to you, which is very interesting to me. Um, and I also thought it was interesting because you're one of the few people who's come to intern with me who knows what Occam is or knows what Patchogue is or knows what Gilman is. Um, so you have to be from Eastern Connecticut to know all those little nuances of the towns that we serve. Um, I'm gonna finish up with you by, you know, would you recommend a career in public health? And if you would, for a young person that's thinking of that career, is there a specific path they should take? Should they follow your path? Should they follow my path? Um, I mean, I think everyone needs to follow their own path. I think that that's really okay. important. Um, I think, Anybody going into public health needs to be really passionate because it's certainly not 
the most lucrative field uh, out there. So you really have to be motivated by passion and not necessarily by um, economic gain. And you did tell me a quote that you like to reference around that issue, right? Didn't you? Uh, oh, yes. Um, now I'm on the spot. I have to That's try okay. to think of it. Uh, expenditures rise to meet income. Excellent. Which uh, made me feel a lot better about the fact that I'm in public health and I don't make a lot of money. So <laughs> I'm going to use that quote all the time. It's true, though. I mean, I even if you were to have a larger income, you'd probably just end up spending more. So. There you go. Um, yeah, and it's such a great progressive field full of incredible people. I can't speak highly enough of the people that I've been able to meet in the field and work with. So you'll definitely be in good company if you're, mm -hmm. if you're coming into the public health field, but definitely it's, it's not something that you can go into without uh, having intrinsic motivation for sure. Awesome. And finally, would you um, ever consider recommending an internship with the local health district for, you know, after now spending a couple days with us, um, do you think it, it serves the purpose that you were looking for? Um, is there something we should be doing as local health directors um, to be able to create some sort of a workforce development that maybe isn't there? Um, so thinking about that pers perspective as a student, um, how can Connecticut health directors get students interested in careers in public health? So I've loved working with the Uncas Health District. I think that it's it's been great and um, everybody's been extremely welcoming and provided me with the inside look on how things really happen at a local level and uh, sort of the, the dynamics of working with different towns and um, in addressing really, you know, you're working with, with small populations where um, people need to feel comfortable with, with the district that's serving them. And I think that, that the Uncas Health District has done a fantastic job with facilitating that, that connection and making sure that they're approachable to the community and that they're really invested in the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. So the one thing that I promised I would say before we leave today is that you um, should go to our YouTube page because we upload the videos now to our YouTube page um, for the Uncas Health District and this video will be on there. And I also know that we've never had a Facebook uh, posting that <laughs> received as many <laughs> likes as the Facebook posting we put with you on it. So I'm assuming everybody that's a friend of yours and a family member is gonna be watching you on video. Um, so I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today, Christine. Thank it's you been so much for wonderful to have you as a guest. Um, we're going to have you many more times, and we're going to keep sending those grant applications to you so you can write those blank checks. Great, uh -huh. yeah. So as soon as I uh, have the opportunity to write a blank check, you'll I'll do it for <laughs> yeah. us. Great. So thanks again for watching us on Public Health Matters with the Uncas Health District. I'm Patrick McCormick, your host, and we'll see you on our next show. Thank you.